And I, today, I think we're going to be really, really pleasantly surprised and kind of, I think, shift. I'm all about think different. So I'm hoping that we can, at the end of this presentation, be thinking differently about those students that we see. Many of you in the chat box, you can answer right now. Do you already have some children in mind as you're listening to this presentation? Like the newness has worn off and they are no longer little angels sitting at their desks. They're sort of exploring, figuring out where your boundaries are, figuring out what they can get away with, figuring out who they can bring along with them to get away with. And so if that's the case, then hopefully you're going to have some great tools that you can go right back to the classroom with tomorrow because it's only Tuesday. So tomorrow. question of the hour. So interception <laughs> is a sense and um, it is our ability to feel the inside of our bodies. So when you notice your stomach growling or your heart racing or your muscles tensing up, you feel those things because of interoception. And the emerging research is also advocating a different process that our emotions come from our bodies. And so if you're really in touch with the way your body feels, then that also in turn allows you to be in touch with your emotions and helps you to identify your emotion in a split second. You can answer the question, how do I feel right now because of introception? Uh, so it's not necessarily just memorizing a little picture card, like this is happy. It's actually knowing what that feels like in your body gives you a meaning behind what happy is. So how do we, as parents, let's go back there. Let's go back. We have an infant, and we're working with that infant. We're bonding with our with our child. How is is that concept learned? How how do we learn it? And how do children come to school without knowing that, not having that sense? Where is the the gap? Where is the breakage? At what point? Um, we do not know yet that answer. We don't know where the breakdown is happening. Uh, we have learned a lot about interoception in the last uh, few decades, and most of what we know is from neuroscience research, but um, we have so many more questions than we have answers right now, um, especially as um, it relates to the practical side. Like, how does how does interoception practically affect our lives, like through development? And where does the breakdown happen? Um, we have a lot more to learn. And what are some, just some ideas around how that's impacted how you look at behavior? And, and those of us who are looking at behavior, how can knowing, having students have a deeper awareness of interoception and teaching it in a different way, how might that affect behavior? our behavior outcomes we're looking for. So what we're finding is that there are a lot of children that have what we call poor interoceptive awareness. And all that means is that they're um, really not, they're not noticing the way their bodies feel. And our bodies are designed to provide us with that first, uh, that first alert that something is going on and that we need to use a coping strategy or um, some kind of, we need to take a break. And so if you're not noticing, if your students aren't noticing the feelings in their body, bodies, then they're not getting that really important cue or that motivation to use these strategies that we're trying to teach them to use, these behavioral control strategies, emotional regulation strategies, whatever you want to call them. But they're not internally motivated or urged to use these strategies because they're missing these important interception cues from within their bodies. So a lot of our interventions are kind of putting the cart behind, before the horse, so to speak. Anna, you talk about, and I really like your term co-regulation, and as a teacher, I've always thought about self-regulation and mm -hmm. what's happening just with myself, what's happening with the children I'm working with, but not what's happening with us together, that whole co-regulation. The term co-regulation, it's kind of that concept that we're, you know, in classrooms and at home, we're asking parents and we're, you know, and we're asking teachers to kind of help with impulse control. But I think we would be asking less help in that area if we kind of backed up and said, okay, so before impulse control, what we need is self-regulation. Because if you can self-regulate, right, you don't need to use that part of the brain to, to um, activate the impulse control. But right before self-regulation is that concept of co-regulation. So, you know, at the beginning of life, there's a lot of co-regulation with the baby and the mom and the dad and the family, the holding and that co-regulating experience. 
And that once they have those many days and many hours of co-regulation, it feeds into self-regulation. And when Kelly and I talked, I kind of knew it was like, you know, finding the other member of your tribe because she said the bridge from co-regulation into self-regulation is interoception awareness. We have these kids who are really well versed in the language of social skills. And I think it's been taught a lot and thankfully so because that languaging is important. But what I've noticed is, is that with children, sometimes there isn't a vessel within where they can contain all the skills they've learned. So it's like, sometimes it's like they learn a skill and then it just kind of goes through the funnel, right? And it just kind of exits. There's no, there's no place for it to land and, and take hold. One of the big areas of research right now is in um, children with trauma or have past trauma, a past trauma history. And almost every single uh, child and adult that has a, uh, has experienced a trauma is found to have poor interceptive awareness. So there is a lot of trauma or a lot of uh, interception work going on in the trauma field right now. I mean, poor interceptive awareness is correlated with kids that have that are obese, that um, have low levels of physical activity. Uh, it's correlated with ADHD, anxiety disorders, depression, autism. I mean, the list goes on. So it really is a pervasive issue, um, one that we have until this point not been aware of. Um, but the good news is that research clearly shows that you can improve interceptive awareness. And, and I might be biased, but I think it's good for all of us. It, it has enhanced my life working on my own personal interceptive awareness. Um, and we, that's what we're seeing in even general education classrooms where kids might have typical interceptive awareness, but just becoming more aware of your body's needs is healthy for them and it, it helps them to regulate themselves uh, in a more advanced way. In order for me to take somebody else's perspective, I have to first come from it from my own perspective. I have to know how I think and I feel first before I can then translate it and take the other perspective. And I think whenever you quiet down your interoceptive awareness, um, you for sure, it's a lot harder to get to regulation because you have to have awareness first, then regulation comes in. How do you even teach that? That's intriguing to me. Can you answer? Do you know that? How would you, how do you teach that in school? It's such a subtle, interesting concept. What we really tried hard to do was to make what we were asking teachers to do really, really simple. Like I told you, it takes 15 seconds to do a body check um, and students become fairly independent with that. And it doesn't require a lot of teacher guidance. They can even start to do it independently. Um, and the other thing is we help, we, we try to prioritize, especially in the teams, the IEP teams or the um, educational teams that I work within. That I have found working with teachers, one of their biggest concerns continues to be classroom management. Yes. And because it's such a concern, it interferes with all of the learning they want those children to be doing. By providing these tools that make sense and they can see make a difference, but don't compromise or take away from to the minute instruction that has to be provided. And it really is to the minute. Now, so what would you do if you're in a classroom, you're seeing they're doing school moves, but you have this extra added knowledge that I don't have around this, this piece. And how would you integrate that in? Or would there be some language you would just use to add to that? I'm curious. Yeah, so one of our strategies is called IA on the fly. And it's just a really uh, strange, I guess, name for talking the interception talk. So it's just basically saying, like, so if you're doing the dots and squeezies, I would say, how's that making your hands feel? Like, super simple. You're just. So how does that make you feel? Which is a huge question. Yes. You're saying, how does that make your hands feel? Yeah. 
there's a big language component to being able to describe the way your body feels. We are adding terms to our learners, um, AAC or whatever communication devices they are. We're doing lots of things. I never presume that these kids can't learn interceptive awareness. It just requires a slightly different approach. One of the busy, biggest examples we have is that we're working with a kid that's very low, like low verbal. And um, we began to just work with the concept of hands and fingers. And he's shown in really a significant increase in his ability to verbalize just after three sessions. Do you think, is, this, is your curriculum a little bit better being taught by a behavior specialist coming in on their time? Or do you see that as something, you know, a multidisciplinary team like Kids Brain Tree offers? Most schools don't have a social worker handy, you know, that can really help. And, and this whole team, like Kids Brain Tree, I mean, they are a model for the future. I really think that this is a model that anymore in schools, we're like, now what do we have to teach? Good grief. As a teacher, we're like, now we're teaching them how to feel, their, how they feel inside. I mean, at some point, I think getting that team and having some support from your behavioral specialist who might be trained in it. I mean, would you want teachers coming to your training and being trained directly? Or do you think that's sort of a su support staff? I don't know, how do you see implementation? That's what I always get, is how do we implement th this? Yeah. Who does it? Who's in charge of it? I'm I'm at the math workshop, I'm at the reading workshop. I'm probably not gonna be allowed to go to the interoceptive workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that really, it looks so different depending on the school. Uh, whenever possible, I mean, we all feel better working in teams, so we don't feel like we're going at it alone. And I've trained so many different people with so many different backgrounds. I know there's general education teachers out there that are using these strategies. There's special education teachers. There's, you know, OT, social workers, behavior specialists, the list goes on. And the more people, the more hands on deck we can have. I mean, that I obviously is ideal so that we all feel supported. Um, in this journey, not just with interception, but with everything, because the demand on these on teachers is so, so great. Right? Yeah. Oh, well, that's, see, I think that's a really, I, all of you joined in or joining in right now, I think that's one really good takeaway from this that, I mean, we, there's a lot of them, but I think that's one that I think really shifts how we, yeah. how we work in the classroom. Yes. And to find those moments when things are calm and going well to say, I notice when you're doing this. But yeah, we tend to, in that moment, they're imploding and we're trying to problem solve and teach all this great regulation stuff. And they're like, ah, you know, yeah. we're an I, a and I think that is like the probably... Uh, the most important rule is that a meltdown is not a teaching moment. And I mean, I, 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 I stop, stop. Okay. If I tweeted, I would tweet that out. Uh, you guys all take that as a note. So a meltdown is not a teachable moment. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but we, we are all helpers by trade. Right. And so our instinct is to like get in there and like teach them a skill in that moment. They are not ready and available for learning all they need for, and I was saying they need co-regulation. They need us to be there as a quiet supporter. Like our language should stop, right? They just need everything to go low and slow and know we're there to support them. But the more talking, the more teaching we try to do, it just makes it worse. And and that's just not me saying that. That is the that is the feedback we are hearing over and over and over again from students that can tell us. Emotion words are so abstract, mm -hmm. um, especially yeah. for interceptive awareness. It is just a word to them. They, it is not a meaningful word like it is to us if we have good interceptive awareness. Like if I ask you to define what anxious means or what angry means, you probably part of your definition would include the way that your body feels. And that's what gives you concrete meaning of these words. And so without the, the without interceptive awareness or with poor interceptive awareness, all of this language is so abstract and again until we know what questions to ask these things go completely unnoticed and these kids are really misunderstood thank you penny and liana and kelly for your work and for bringing this really important topic 
to the foreground in changing the way we look at children and their behavior. So thank, thank you, you, everyone. Have a great evening, and we'll see you next month. All right. Thank Bye. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you liked this video, please hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on Crowdcast and sign up for my newsletter at www.schoolmoves.com.